Many of us have been closely watching the war in Ukraine and seeing how it's affected our prices for what we pay for many goods. And today we're taking a deeper look at the war and what has led up to it and what the future may hold with the help of an international policy expert with a unique perspective of growing up with war. Welcome to 91.9 Public Affairs. I'm Micah Terrell. I'm also here with APSU TV. Dr. Vladimir Tapara joins us, and he's uh, here in the studio. And we thank you so much, Dr. Tapara, for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation to the lovely Tennessee for the first time in my life. Wow, so a lot of interesting things you've probably seen. We'll get to those in a little while, but first let's, uh, let's ask about you and, and your experience. So you've been with the International, um, I'm sorry, the Institute of International Politics and Economics since 2011, and that's in um, Serbia. So please tell us how you got into that role and what you do in your role there. Yes, I'm an international relations scholar from Serbia, a small but proud country in southeastern Europe. I've been working at the Institute of International Politics and Economics since 2011, and this institute is actually one of the oldest institutes in Europe for studying international relations, not, not just in Serbia and the Balkans. Uh, uh, we deal with many international issues, have several subdivisions. One of them is subdivision uh, which uh, I am in charge of uh, as the head of the, the Center for Euro-Atlantic Studies. So, so we, we study Euro-Atlantic area, personally me, U.S. foreign policy, but I also deal with Russia's foreign policy and U.S.-Russian relations, and I don't have a problem to, to tackle any hot topic uh, in international relations, which is uh, currently at the front line. Right. Now, um, you grew up in, or you were born in Bosnia, and you've seen conflict firsthand. Tell us a little bit more about how that influenced you growing up and became part of an interest that you have now. Yes, I was born in Bosnia, which is now a neighboring country to Serbia, but back then in 1982, uh, they were part of uh, the same country, Socialist Yugoslavia. And actually, I spent uh, only a, a part of my early childhood there. Uh, and uh, didn't witness uh, the war firsthand. I think I'm uh, speaking about war in Bosnia. But yes, I experienced it uh, secondhand because my father fought in it on the side of Bosnian Serbs. And I lived in Serbia during it, which was under UN sanctions because of its role in Bosnian war. And my uh, firsthand experience of war came only in 1999 when NATO bombed Serbia because of the events in Kosovo. So, uh, and that moment in 1999 was actually the decisive moment for me when I decided uh, to get an interest into politics, international relations, history, in order uh, to try to explain why it happened to us. And I admit that uh, so far for these 25 years, I haven't got a full answer, but I'm still looking for it. And I'm sure you'll probably be digging more. And you got to share your research recently with, with Austin Peay students during a lecture. How was that, getting yeah. to talk with them? Yeah, this, uh, I, I shared with them uh, my research into Russia's foreign policy and U.S.-Russian uh, relations in particular, uh, particular also tackling this uh, Russo-Ukrainian War. I had uh, this big lecture with the students and a smaller one for, for the faculty. And uh, I think I managed to, uh, to get them familiar with the basics about Russian foreign policy, but, but also to put some of my original uh, uh, stuff, more sophisticated uh, stuff, some, uh, to get into some nuances about Russia and U.S.-Russian relations. And I think the feedback was great, both by the students and the, the faculty. Right, because it's a really complicated topic, I think, for a lot of people. Every, every international relations topic is complicated. Right. And Russia and similar great U.S. and China great powers are mostly complicated. Yes. Now, you've done a lot of research. I got to try to, to read through a, a lot of what you've done. You've had about 50 scientific papers and yes. then three scientific monographs. And um, the first, The Time of Reset, uh, Russia and U.S. Relations, 2009 to 2012, and Russia's Wars, 1999 to 2019, and then Russia and Ukraine, 
uh, origins of a tragedy. What lessons uh, can we learn from those works that you yeah. worked on? Well, uh, unfortunately, most of these of my works are in Serbian, but I have several articles written uh, in English, which could be found online. And these uh, three scientific books are in Serbian. What lessons? Well, uh, uh, all these th three books are very different because uh, they uh, were written in different periods. This time of research uh, you spoke about, I, I was starting to, uh, to prepare material uh, for it uh, while a U.S.-Russian reset, uh, which was uh, uh, so far the, the most uh, uh, promising attempt of rapprochement of the two powers that happened between the presidents Medvedev and Obama. And later, uh, actually, it failed. So uh, until the moment uh, I finished writing that book, I had to write it about uh, a failed project, about, about the failed approachment. And then um, I went to writing about Russia's wars, uh, motivated by Russia's intervention, first in Ukraine and then in Syria. And in the end, uh, uh, February 2022 happened. And actually, at that moment, I was into preparing uh, some other book about U.S. foreign policy. But this war abruptly came out, so I had to abandon that about U.S. foreign policy and get into writing about Russo-Ukrainian war. And here we are, right? So And le lessons are numerous. The biggest lesson is that uh, during this whole period, uh, U.S.-Russian relations were in constant deterioration until we have this indirect war they wage against each other in Ukraine. Right, and we'll talk more about that. And again, if you're just tuning in, uh, this is Micah Terrell with 91.9 Public Affairs and APSU-TV. I'm speaking with Dr. Vladimir Tampara, who is from the Institute of International Politics and, Econ Politics and Economics in Belgrade. Thank you again for talking about your research. Now, let's switch a little bit to the, the concept of hegemony, which again is, is something that a lot of people may not understand. So could you explain how this concept is often mis misunderstood in the area of policy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this book I was preparing before Russo-Ukrainian War should have been about uh, U.S. hegemony. And uh, there are many uh, different definitions of hegemony, and the problem is that I uh, disagree with most of them. I have my own definition. Because uh, these, uh, this majority of scholars uh, speak of contemporary U.S. as if it is already a world hegemon, which, uh, in my opinion, is not true. In order to, in order to become a global hegemon, you have to eliminate uh, the remaining independent great powers from the international system and thus uh, transform uh, uh, this system from anarchic one into a hierarchic one, uh, led from one center. And it uh, never happened, actually. Today, uh, besides the U.S., we have two other independent great powers, Russia and China. And as long as uh, uh, two of them do not want to accept American hegemony, America is not a hegemon. It is only a wannabe hegemon. So the, the country that leads hegemonic policy aimed at establishing such position in the world system. And it looks like Russia and China are becoming sort of friends. Yeah, and so yeah. That they're, they're, they're getting uh, closer and closer together in the face of this American mm -hmm. hegemonism, yes. So yeah, so now uh, speaking more about uh, Russian Federation President Vladimir Putin, in your opinion, what do you think about what will influence um, his decision to eventually end the war in Ukraine? Well, uh, it is, uh, mm, he is not the only one uh, uh, upon, he, upon his, whose decision it depends. Uh, on Russian side, yes, because uh, he is a clear-cut autocrat. Uh, so uh, it was his decision to get into this war. It would be his decision if, if he wanted to to, uh, to pull Russia out of it, but uh, also other side uh, should be asked, Ukrainians and, and political West. Uh, what I think uh, should influence his possible decision to get out of this war is uh, that, that at some moment he realizes that he achieved something at the battlefield 
that he could present to his public opinion as victory, although objectively it would not be victory. I, I think Russia cannot win in, in Ukraine. Simply it is impossible because uh, Western weapons uh, that is supplied to Ukrainian army is uh, of more of bigger quality than Russian ones. And then what about sanctions? Uh, President Joe Biden has put more than 500 more sanctions. Yeah. I think February was the of this year. Um, so how do you think those um, sanctions have affected Russia at all? And then um, what about a possible shift in the political and economic focus towards the East, for instance? Yeah, uh, sanctions, uh, sanctions are, of course, the parallel strategy. I got uh, uh, military means, uh, supplying military equipment and weapons to, to Ukraine, and uh, on the other hand, sanctions against Russia aimed at exhausting its uh, economy, exhausting its resources, but uh, uh, so far uh, it, it hasn't proven effective. So it, it, is, it is very, uh, very difficult to end the war by sanctions, but I think uh, these uh, uh, Western sanctions have uh, other long-term goal uh, to, to exhaust Russia in, a, in some longer Cold War with the U.S. that will uh, follow regardless of how uh, Russo-Ukrainian war ends. And of course uh, that uh, these sanctions and cutting ties with the West forced Russia to turn to China, to rely on China and to become in a way uh, dependent on, ch on China, economically, of course, and maybe in the longer run, uh, politically. Mm -hmm. What do you, uh, because again, I, I think back to the original Cold War where we had nuclear was the concern here. What do you think, and I know that's probably venturing a little bit militarily, but what do you think with, with, with China being uh, basically a, a good friend, maybe even ally down the road, what there could be with Russia strength-wise that way? Uh, you mean uh, China will be stronger with Russia on its mm -hmm. side or, yes. or, 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 or vice versa, either way? Yeah, well, of course, uh, Russia with uh, Chinese economic backing and China possibly with Russian military. And uh, I'll remind you that Russia is still officially counted as a second uh, military power in the world, yes, that, that would be a formidable coalition, but it is still uh, not a clear coalition like NATO is. Mm. And there are many possible reasons for this, and one of them is that uh, China uh, wouldn't like to get involved in Russia's war in Ukraine and possibly with the West, while on the other hand Russia wouldn't like to uh, get automatically involved in some uh, China-US clash over Taiwan. So this is still not a full alliance, but uh, close partnership it is. It is, definitely. Now, many people have sort of just tuned out or basically almost ignored the war in Ukraine because it's been going on now for two years. Um, but why should people here in Tennessee, uh, Middle Tennessee area in the U.S. Uh, by extension, why should they care about what's going on in the Balkans? Yeah, the, the, uh, not in the Balkans, but in the Eastern, in the, Eastern, Eastern Europe. Europe sorry, in Europe, yes. no. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, it is not only uh, the case here. Uh, you mentioned the Balkans. In, in, in Serbia, it is also the case. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the war uh, between uh, Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh uh, erupted, and especially when uh, Israelis attacked uh, Hamas in Gaza, uh, Russo-Ukrainian uh, war uh, suddenly disappeared from front pages. But it is still the, the hottest topic in international relations. So uh, you in the U.S. Uh, should think about this war, and not only about this war, but about Russian foreign policy, because Russia is uh, still, uh, as I said, military power number two, one of the remaining uh, two great powers besides the United States, uh, the only state that has nuclear parity, with the United States and, and that can destroy not only the United States but the, the whole world. So you have to think about Russia and also there is this uh, ideological uh, challenge from Russia. It is not uh, the same 
as it was during the time of Soviet Union when, when there was a clear cut ideological clash between capitalism and communism. It, this is something else. Uh, because now Russia is trying to present itself as a defender of uh, so-called uh, Christian values, Conser conservative values uh, which it thinks are compromised in the decadent West, as Putin and, and his associates uh, like to put it. So uh, this ideological uh, challenge uh, uh, means that uh, actually uh, Russia doesn't have to attack the West militarily to gain something. It could uh, attack it by propaganda, by ideology, by, by f finding uh, uh, similar political movements throughout the West, in the US, in, in, in Europe, and, and to, to make some alliance with them. I, I think uh, this is actually even a bigger challenge for the US, and I think your President Biden is aware of that. Uh, he, he, he showed that he was aware of that when uh, he mentioned this inflection point uh, in which the world is now where there is a struggle between democracy and autocracy, not only between democratic and autocratic countries, but within democratic countries, between the forces that maybe would like to undermine democracy. Right, and definitely. And um, speaking along those lines too, uh, President Putin has claimed several times um, about the war in Ukraine that there's a need for denazification right. of, of Ukraine specifically which is it's, it seems kind of weird it's like President Zelensky is is not he's Jewish but he's speaking yeah. more he said of it's demilitarization denazification and then in his words and neutralization as well that he says those need to happen in order for there to be more peaceful relations there well a neutralization he could have it Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Ukraine was a neutral country in most of its existence as an independent state, but actually, uh, actually, uh, it uh, appeared that it was uh, that Putin was not satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. He wanted whole Ukraine in its in his sphere of influence, in in Russia's sphere of influence, integrated with Russia in uh, Eurasian Economic Union. So, new, uh, Ukrainian neutrality doesn't. Uh, satisfy him. Uh, militarization, it could mean anything, uh, but uh, I suppose uh, Putin thinks of Ukraine which is militarily weak so that it cannot uh, endanger territories which Russia annexes in the process of this war. And denazification, uh, when you mention Zelensky that he's a Jew, uh, for Putin, uh, everyone in Ukraine who is against Russia and who wants to dis distance himself from Russia is a Nazi. Because he, he doesn't uh, recognize uh, Ukrainian uh, autochthonous uh, strive for independence, for, for separate identity. He, he sees it as uh, some evil plot by some foreign powers, such as was uh, a plot of uh, Nazi Germany in the Second World War. And now he sees the same in Western behavior, and he calls those Ukrainians that are in favor of the West uh, Nazis. Mm -hmm. Very interesting choice of words, yeah. I would say. Right? Well, interesting, but uh, understandable because uh, Russia and Putin uh, are trying hard to legitimize uh, Russia's role in international relations. Uh, by calling uh, upon this uh, role of the Soviet Union in the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, this vic great victory in, in the great patriotic war against Nazism. Right. And they think they, they, they lead uh, that war now also, that Nazism was not defeated then and that they have to defeat it now. But when we look at this uh, conservative ideology uh, Putin adheres to, it is uh, actually very similar to Nazism and, and his behavior in Ukraine, uh, uh, taking Ukrainian uh, territory uh, by invoking uh, that uh, Russian-speaking people are in danger. It uh, reminds much of how Hitler behaved uh, in Czechoslovakia and Poland uh, at the beginning of World War II. Yeah, the, I was going to say the similar, similarities between their yeah, ideologies very, are very, 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 very great, definitely. 
Um, now let's work on it. We went back back into the 40s to talk about Hitler, but let's talk a little bit more recent comparison between uprisings that have happened. Um, October 2000, President Milosevic in, Milosevic, country, in, in, yeah, in Serbia, and then in 2014, what happened um, with the President um, Yanukovych in, in Ukraine. I hope I said that right. Mm -hmm. So can, let's compare those uprisings and what can be learned from those too. Well, it, it is relatively easy to compare it. Uh, because the uh, uprising against uh, Milosevic on the 5th of October 2000 was actually a defense uh, of the electoral will of the people. Because there, there were uh, presidential elections and people around Milosevic tried to steal them or at least to, to, to uh, postpone them. And uh, people rose up, opposition rose up, uh, supported by uh, some countries in the West, and they defended this electoral will. And the similar thing happened in so-called color revolutions uh, throughout post-Soviet states. Uh, uh, Rose Revolution in Georgia in 2003, next year Orange Revolution in Ukraine, uh, Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan in uh, 2005, a uh, common thing for all these revolutions was defense of electoral will. But in 2014 in Ukraine, we didn't have that. Th there were no elections. Uh, actually, democratically elected leader Yanukovych, regardless of, of his later behavior, uh, was removed for power unconstitutionally. And uh, uh, at that moment, uh, uh, also, this uh, agreement he had with the opposition and with foreign leaders of uh, France, Germany, and Poland was uh, broken. So, this wasn't uh, either legal or legitimate. It was an uh, illegal, in a way, violent revolution against Yanukovych, and it provoked later uh, Russia's res response in annexing Crimea and uh, supporting uh, rebels uh, in eastern parts of Ukraine, in, in Donbass. Yeah, so it's interesting it, how those... In movements. my opinion, it shouldn't have happened that way, regardless of who Yanukovych was and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, what his decisions were. It, it just uh, provoked Putin to act as he acted then. And related to that, how, because again, Russia's had a role in those, in, of course, what happened after those. How about Russian and Serbian relations? How would you characterize those now? Um, some recent reports in Western media say it's sort of a, a balancing act that you have Serbian uh, government officials, uh, they want to seek EU status. Meanwhile, though, they are making friends in Moscow and, and working to keep up those relations as well. So how would you... Uh, it is very interesting and very complicated the questions. I, I dealt very much with mm -hmm. that. I, I could talk about that for a whole show, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I'll try to make it as simple as I can. Uh, uh, Russia and Serbia are traditionally close states, not, not uh, in the sense of the states, of the elites, but in the sense of the people. Uh, there is this uh, notion of brotherhood between uh, Serbs and Russians, of course stronger in Serbia, uh, I, I can say that uh, Serbs are actually the most uh, Russophil uh, people in the whole Europe, save for, for possibly Belarusians. And uh, given that we today in Serbia uh, have a populist autocrat, Aleksandar Vucic, in power, uh, who has to legitimize uh, uh, his power from time to time in, in, in the elections that are neither free nor fair, but, but still he, he wants to, to have some kind of uh, plebiscitary support by the people, who has, he has to present himself as a kind of Russophil, so that he could get votes from the majority of Serbian people. But on the other hand, Serbia is firmly inside Western sphere of influence. And Serbia is uh, under much bigger influence of the West than of Russia. And uh, Vucic has to, uh, to have this on his mind uh, all the time, because uh, if uh, he uh, would get uh, close, uh, too close to Russia, he could be punished for that by the West. He would be removed 
from power. Actually, uh, Vucic uh, was once uh, against uh, uh, the West and against uh, the membership of Serbia in the European Union. And then he realized he would never be allowed to come to power uh, if he, unless he changed his policy. So he, he made this 180% uh, uh, degree turn in, back in 2008 and uh, became pro-European and uh, in a few years he came to power and now he, he grips firmly on, on this power by, by this balancing between Russia and uh, the West, but it is actually uh, a balancing between public opinion in Serbia who is pro-Russian and the West who, who has this physical influence in Serbia. Very interesting yeah. how that, that works out. Thank you for explaining it in terms mm -hmm. to understand. Now, what about um, in, in Serbia? Obviously, they're seeing more uh, refugees from Ukraine coming in, as well as the Balkan region. Yeah. Um, not, not many of them to Serbia. There, there are some there Ukrainians, some. but uh, more in some other states, in Romania, in states. Poland. Right, in Romania. Uh, yeah. How is that affecting the economy of that area? Uh, yeah, but uh, there, are, uh, there are many Russians in Serbia, actually. Because uh, Serbia is the only country in Europe uh, which still has uh, uh, airline, regular airline with uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg and, and some other uh, Russian um, uh, cities. Uh, and uh, we have uh, no visas with Russia. So Russian people can freely move to Serbia. And many of them uh, moved to Serbia uh, because either they couldn't... Uh, uh, do their jobs in Russia under sanctions because they, they depended on uh, tr financial transactions with, with the West, uh, mainly uh, IT experts. Mm -hmm. But many people also came, uh, also left Russia because they disagreed with uh, Putin, with uh, his autocracy, with his decision to, to attack Ukraine and to avoid possible mobilization for the war. So many of them are now in Serbia, and most of them are hard critics uh, uh, of Putin. And uh, it reminds me of uh, the period between the two world wars after the October Revolution, when many people who were against the revolution came to what was then Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. So the, their impact upon our society then was uh, similar than the one we have Today, of course, uh, uh, it is in a way good for our economy because they bring money. But uh, may, uh, I think for the, for the plain people, it is not good because uh, they increase prices with their money. So it's yeah. a, the double, it's double, a double edge. Yeah, a double edge sword, <laughs> definitely. Um, in case you're just joining us, I'm Micah Terrell with 91.9 Public Affairs and APSU TV. Thank you so much for joining us. We're speaking with Dr. Vladimir Chapara. Thank you again for joining us. He's from the Institute of International uh, Politics and Economics in Belgrade. Thank you for traveling all this way to speak with us. Now, based on your knowledge in, of the area and then the research that you've done, what do you think the Russian Federation's interests are in the Balkan area, the Middle East, and the Sahel region? It is also an interesting uh, uh, question. I will start with Sahel. I do not m know much about that, but I see that uh, Russian uh, mercenaries were present there. That I think it is a lucrative business for Russia to be present there. I don't see any other geopolitical or economic uh, motive other than this uh, mercenary thing. And in the Middle East, uh, uh, Middle East is the ground uh, where Russia actually showed that it is still a great power because in order to qualify as a great power, you have to uh, prove that you're capable of uh, waging wars outside your own region. So Middle East was a good ground for that because it is far from Russia, and there was this uh, military base in Syria, in Tartus, later they, they uh, opened a new one in Khmeim. So I think this, uh, the motive uh, behind Russia's intervention in, into Syria is so that it uh, could uh, prove that it can have a foothold in a distant region, such as Middle East is, and to prove it is still uh, a great power. And of course, there is this strategic partnership with 
Iran. Iran and Russia uh, help each other a lot. Uh, we saw that Iranians' uh, uh, foothold also in the whole Middle East is bigger after Russia's intervention in Syria. And on the other hand, the Iranians sold uh, these drones to Russia, which proved very effective in, in Ukrainian war. And you mentioned the Balkans. The Balkans is an interesting thing because once upon a time, uh, during uh, the time of Russian Empire and Soviet Union, uh, uh, Moscow uh, was much more interested in the Balkans. Uh, uh, it's geopolitical game against Ottoman Empire, Austria, Hungary, etc. But Russian Federation, this contemporary state, uh, uh, didn't show so uh, big interest in Balkans. And it was such, uh, I think, uh, only until uh, 2022. Uh, so because when this war erupted and when the West uh, tried to isolate Russia, uh, Serbia proved uh, as the only country that still wanted to, to have good relations with Russia. And uh, it is this uh, good example of uh, Russia Today, RT uh, abbreviation. Uh, this is this global Russian uh, television network which has uh, many franchises and uh, many journalists uh, from Serbia uh, for years asked them to make uh, a franchise here in Serbia, in, in the Balkans, and they refused to do that. They didn't have interest to, to do that, but they did it in 2022 mm. because uh, uh, the doors for RT were shut down in the whole Europe. And in order to still be present in Europe, they opened the franchise in Serbia. So this is why uh, their interest in the Balkans increased recently, but they cannot do much uh, about it. They, their influence simply cannot be as big as the Western here because of the geography. Uh, Western countries, the Western sphere of influence is far more to the east uh, from the Balkans. And along those same lines, Western media, there seems to be just more of it, more, you know, Western-based media, yeah. you know, doing things, whereas in Russia, it seemed like there were many journalists who fled, especially after the Ukraine war, because they couldn't do their jobs yes. like they needed to. Yes, so yes, just, yes. You, know. uh, uh, you speak of Western journalists who, who worked for RT there in mm -hmm. Moscow, yes. Right, yes, exactly. Right. Now, how do you predict the war in Ukraine ending? Uh, what is sort of a time frame? that you could see for that and um, how do you think it will affect the development of Europe over overall? Well, uh, prediction is always difficult. Uh, for example, I did not predict Russo-Ukrainian war until a few days ahead of it. I thought that Putin was bluffing by military buildup on Ukrainian borders, but this war happened. So now I, I don't dare uh, uh, to, to give some brave uh, predictions, but I can talk about probability. And I think that uh, probability is small of either side victory. I mean in objective terms, victory. It is always possible that someone declares victory, although it is not, and to convince its public opinion that his side won. But objectively, I think that the biggest probability uh, how this sense in, in Ukraine is some kind of Korean scenario, some kind of a ceasefire without political solution at the current front line. And we will see when this will happen. I doubt it will happen this year, may, maybe the next one. Uh, first, the, both sides should, should get exhausted in this war of attrition so, so that they realize that the uh, continuation of the war doesn't pay off. Uh, to them. And I, I really see this that this way because uh, it is certain that you, Russia is stronger than Ukraine, but the West is stronger than Russia and it helps Ukraine it, and, it, and it won't allow uh, Russia's victory at any cost, even if it would mean uh, getting boots on the ground mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Yeah, because it seems like we have if you would imagine hypothetically, you have 
very big Russia over here, very small Ukraine, yeah. it seems like. But then, like you said, the, in the background, there are the, the big biggest, friends behind West. Ukraine yeah. yeah, that are yeah. there to hear here's some more, you know, yeah. uh, patriot that, missiles. That, that, yeah. that actually leads to this stalemate and Korean mm -hmm. scenario. Right. And I think you're right. I think it's just going to take some time. Yeah. It just seems it, it'll take time. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Now, let's talk about Moldova. Um, in, your, in your mind, in your judgment, how uh, should the government of Moldova be worried about a possible Russian invasion? Because it, there's been talk about that. I've read some reports of it. But it sounds like they have at least a few high-profile leaders from Moldova meeting with Russian leaders. So it sounds like they're trying to perhaps maybe avoid something. What are, what are you hearing? And what, are, what is your judgment about that right now? Well, I think in, in Moldova, uh, uh, they had uh, recently several changes of governments from pro-Russian to anti-Russian. And they all the time kept this neutrality, but they have uh, this hot issue with Russia about Transnistria, which is de facto independent from Moldova and under Russia's protection. But I don't think Moldova should be uh, afraid of some Russia's invasion unless Russia wins in, in uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So uh, Russia is now uh, physically cut off from Moldova and Transnistria. It should uh, uh, take uh, Nikolaev and Odessa to, to, to get there. So until it happens, and I think it won't happen for, for the reason I, I mentioned, I think uh, Moldova shouldn't be worried. But okay, hedging is always a, a, a good strategy. It, it has to, to find a way to be on good terms with, with Russia as much as it is possible so that uh, avoid provoking Russia in, in such a uh, uh, in such uh, an intervention, like uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, uh, once Georgian president, uh, did in 2008. The, he, he allowed uh, Russia to provoke him to attack South Ossetia, and then we saw what happened. Mm -hmm, definitely. And that leads me to my next question about um, America, and then um, should the West in America and, of course, other Western countries, Western Europe as well, should they be worried about Russia's um, seeking this um, neo-imperial aspirations that they have in the Ukraine war? Yeah. Again, if uh, Russia wins at Ukraine, it would be very bad for the West. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know how NATO could be a credible protector of Baltic states then. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, who are far smaller than Ukraine with far, far uh, more modest capacities to defend on their own against Russia. And imagine Russia attacks them after it wins uh, in Ukraine. Uh, will the U.S. say we won't uh, send boots on the ground because it, because it would mean the war with Russia and nuclear ex escalation? It, it says the same thing here in, in Ukraine. And the justification is that Ukraine is not part of NATO, so the so, uh, U.S. is not obliged to defend it with boots on the ground. But, but it is only an excuse. We know that the reason is that uh, the U.S. Uh, fears nuclear escalation with Russia, but it will also fear that in the Baltics. This is why I think uh, the U.S. should stop Russia in Ukraine, because other dominoes will, will follow. That was going to ask you, yeah. the dominoes will have the domino effect for sure. Yeah. Now, what would, the advice would you give to uh, U.S. diplomatic leaders about how to um, proceed in the relationship with Ukraine at this point? Uh, under any circumstances, they uh, mustn't allow Putin win in Ukraine, even if that meant boots on the ground. But when I say boots on the ground, I don't say they should fight Russians. They could just send their troops, Americans and their NATO allies, uh, to areas in Ukraine uh, where Russian uh, troops are not present. And uh, they should uh, draw a line and say, OK, now Russians, it's your turn. Attack us if you dare. And Russians won't dare to attack for the same reason, mm -hmm. fearing of nuclear escalation. I think this would be a, a, a good thing uh, to, to check uh, a further Russian invasion into Ukraine. But it would have it, its price, and that price would be a de facto division of Ukraine. Because what, what is left, it would be left to Russians. But it would be temporary, 
and, in, and no one will recognize that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, let's recall when in 1940 Soviet Union annexed uh, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, uh, the US never recognized that. Right. So it, it doesn't yeah. have to recognize anything now else. Now, on the, the other side of the coin, what advice would you give to Russian Federation leaders about how to proceed in Ukraine? Uh, to Russian Federation leaders, once Putin is removed uh, from power and some new democratic leader is there, however it uh, uh, sounded as a utopia, I would suggest them to leave Ukraine alone, to immediately pull out their troops uh, to the line uh, to the front line uh, which was uh, at, in February uh, 2022, then to negotiate uh, about uh, uh, reintegrating of Donbas into Ukraine with uh, some uh, wide autonomy, especially cultural autonomy and Russian language as the second official language. And about Crimea, I think that uh, some compromise should be uh, found, uh, some concessions both on part of Ukraine and part of Russia. I think uh, the best way would be uh, to repeat the referendum there, but now a free and fair referendum, so that uh, citizens of Crimea uh, could decide whether they would want to remain in Russia or to, to go back to Ukraine. That is my opinion. That is, yeah. And obviously that includes Putin, like you said, being Yeah, out removed of the from power because yeah. with him in power, all this is impossible. Exactly. Now, if we were to think hypothetically about any normal relationship between Russia and European neighbors, Germany, et cetera, uh, in the near future, would that be a possibility realistically with Putin in power or not? I think not. I no. think not. Uh, European Union and its members uh, distancing uh, themselves uh, from Russia more and more. They distancing them, themselves. Uh, in uh, terms of energy supply. So the, they're doing this energy uh, diversification and it is successful so far. So they don't uh, have to look for Russian friendship at any costs anymore. And I think Russia also looks to other side, looks to China, looks to some other parts of the world. But I hope after Putin, some new democratic government will naturally have to cooperate with, uh, the, with Europe and, and vice versa. Yeah, and we'll see what happens, right, eventually, yeah. right. Now, if you're just joining us, I'm Micah Terrell with 91.9 Public Affairs and APSU TV. I'm speaking with Dr. Vladimir Tapar. And Dr. Vladimir Tapar, thank you so much for joining us. He's from the, um, international in the Institute of International uh, Politics and Economics, um, and he's joining us here. So how do you think the world can possibly ever turn return to a peaceful state of being um, despite of or after the war in Ukraine? Well, uh, the world is uh, certainly not as peaceful as it was 10 or 20 years ago, but is uh, still not in the state of some uh, all-out war, like it was during world wars. And I think that not only uh, the Russo-Ukrainian war uh, decides about this, uh, I consider uh, that U.S.-Chinese relations are actually uh, the main axis of whole international relations. So uh, uh, whether the world will be peaceful in the following decades or not will mainly uh, depend on their relations, about how this uh, rivalry between the U.S. and China will play out. For now, it is mostly economically, but it uh, could possibly uh, turn military, and then we all could get into problem. How do you think the U.S. could improve relations with China? With China? Well, I, I think uh, the, uh, given that uh, for now uh, China doesn't show any uh, major signs of uh, revisionism, that mm -hmm. like the U.S. Uh, did with uh, deploying military bases all around the world, uh, uh, forming uh, military alliances such as NATO, such as Quad now, etc. I think that uh, the U.S. should uh, loosen this grip against China a bit and uh, not to try uh, 
to, to make obstacles uh, to its economic growth. Uh, it should devote itself uh, more to uh, cooperation uh, with China, regardless of the fact that China grows bigger than the United States. I mean, uh, there was a situation at the beginning of uh, the 20th century when Great Britain was concerned uh, by the fact that uh, the U.S. Uh, grew bigger economically than itself, but uh, in the end, uh, uh, Britain reconciled it itself with that. So why, why wouldn't uh, the U.S. and China lead the world together? Uh, maybe uh, China economically and uh, the U.S. militarily. Maybe it would be the winning combination, one, one of the winning combinations. And some people might be like, well, well, you know, wait a minute, China, they ideologically are, you know, not yeah, what that, that we, is a, so that, yeah. Yeah, that, that is a problem, but why China couldn't become democratic in the long run? If that, it is possible that Russia becomes democratic, maybe China could do it. And, 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 and uh, we must uh, have on our minds that uh, uh, the U.S. is not as democratic as it used to be. Uh, Freedom House says that since, since the time of Trump. There, there are many troubles here also with, with democracy. So this, is, this democracy autocracy divide is not as sharp as it used to be. And that's a good point. I think a lot of people are seeing that. In, in, yeah. Obviously, since you know, 2001, we had the Patriot Act and a lot of freedoms that people took for granted yeah, were course, taken away. So, yeah, so definitely. Now, what about, you mentioned NATO. Let's talk about NATO for a second. NATO. How could NATO assist in a more peaceful cooperation between the Russian Federation and other countries? I think now it doesn't have any chance of, of succeeding because uh, uh, Russia uh, cooperated with NATO. Uh, at uh, one time, Russia also wanted to join NATO, but, but as, as an equal partner with the United States. And this is why it failed, because the United States wanted Russia to join as one of many uh, members. And then uh, they, uh, as a replacement for Russia's uh, membership, made this NATO-Russia Council, but its activity is now froze, frozen. Uh, Russia considers NATO its arch enemy, so I don't know how, wh what it could do to improve relations with Russia. So it sounds like it might be too late for it to be effective at yeah. this point. Yeah, of course. Definitely. Now, what about uh, Putin's estimate of the Ukrainian people, um, I guess, underestimate of their patriotism and how resilient they've been in the war so far, especially in the eastern areas that have um, some history of pro-Russian sympathies? Yeah, it, it is natural because uh, uh, Putin thought Ukrainians were the same people as Russians and that they were deceived by their Nazi leaders and, and foreign powers and that they, will, uh, that they would uh, actually uh, welcome Russian invading troops with flowers or something, but it didn't happen. Uh, it, it even didn't happen in eastern parts of uh, Ukraine. Russian-speaking populations, even some ethnic Russians, uh, took uh, weapons in their hands to fight against Russia because international relations are not only about uh, ethnicity and, and cultural uh, proximity but uh, about allegiance to, to one or another state. And we, we now see that, that many Russian-speaking Russians in Russia, they, they decided to leave because they disagree with Putin regime. So why would Ukrainians want to, leave, to abandon its own, to give up on its independent Ukraine and live inside Russia, especially in Putin's Russia? So it, it was his uh, biggest miscalculation. And one of the proofs uh, that he uh, made this decision about invasion alone, that he didn't listen to the people who knew something more about that. And there are a lot of people like yourself who know yeah. that area very yeah, course, well. Who could have there are many of them in Russia, but now, now they are silenced. I have many colleagues in Russia that I know. They, they, they cannot uh, express uh, their own opinions freely. They, they, they have to call this war a special military operation or something, although in their minds they disagree with that. Yeah, and they know what it, what it yeah. really is. Now, more on the war in Ukraine. It's stretching, again, on two more than two years. 
What do you think Putin's intentions are at this point, and how do you think, how far do you think he will go to get to his goals? I think uh, that he at least wants to uh, conquer what is rest of Donbass. Because the war started uh, when uh, Putin recognized the uh, independent Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic. So he couldn't say he won in Ukraine unless he had Donbass in, in his hands. And uh, if, he, uh, if he doesn't succeed uh, in conquering what is rest of uh, Kherson and Zaporozhye, he, he could say, okay, for now, let it be like this and, and proclaim victory. But in the longer run, I think he would like to have more, uh, bigger portion of Ukrainian territory and uh, the rest of Ukraine is dysfunctional country. And in the longer, longer run, uh, he would like to see this uh, uh, Christian uh, conservative values crusade all over Europe so that at some point uh, in all European countries, uh, uh, Russian-friendly uh, parties and movements come to power and uh, Europe transform itself to, to some kind of Russia's uh, hegemonic sphere of influence, which would uh, uh, actually mean expelling the United States out. And it is clear from uh, the recent uh, Russia's uh, foreign policy concept where he divides Western countries into two groups. One of them are European continental, with whom he thinks he could get along mm -hmm. at some point, and another group are Anglo-Saxon countries, so the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Australia, and they are uh, arch enemies. They, they have to only be removed from this Eurasian uh, chessboard, as uh, Vigdim Brzezinski called it once upon a time. Yeah, and how far do you, th do you think he would just keep trying to keep dividing those, those ones that he thinks might, might, might sway towards him? I mean, time-wise, it could be years? I mean, I guess as long as he's well, alive. Well, as long as he's alive, because yeah. I, I think he, he, won't, he can't be removed from power unless he dies. I mean, there was this Prigozhin uh, rebellion, uh, we saw how it ended up. So I, uh, at the moment, I don't think some uh, a promising democratic movement in Russia, at some point it may appear, but with Putin firmly in power, I think we would have to wait until he dies. I don't know what else I could answer to this yeah, question. Yeah, no, that we've and we've talked about a lot, so yeah. no, that's great. Now we have discussed quite a bit, and I, I wanted to ask you, what else did we not talk about that you wanted to address today? Maybe something about uh, U.S.-Serbian relations. Yeah, relations between mm -hmm. two, two our countries. Uh, I will tell you a story that many Americans maybe don't know that. Actually, in the whole Eastern Europe, uh, uh, in the 80s of the uh, last century, uh, Serbs were actually most uh, pro-Western, pro-American people. We, we liked uh, uh, U.S. culture very much through movies, through, through, through mu music, and all other things. And then when, when the Yugoslavia uh, broke up and war started, uh, most of our people and our elites got disappointed in the United States because Washington sided with our enemies in, in, in these wars. So eventually the, they bombed us in, in 1999. So, so this, is a, this is what bitters our, our relations now. But I think our relations could be improved if the U.S. could only slightly change its, its policy toward better understanding Serbs and uh, what, what we are grieving uh, about, that uh, we, we feel a kind of injustice. We, we feel that all the others in the region are some kind, uh, in, in some way, rewarded by the, by the U.S., uh, while only we are punished. And we, we are still being punished in Kosovo, which is internationally unrecognized, but there are pressures, pressures against our government to recognize Kosovo now. And we, we seek some compromise solutions. So if the U.S. could uh, support some compromise solution in Kosovo, like there was a compromise solution in Bosnia with Dayton uh, Accords, uh, 
okay? And I think our relations could uh, be much, much better in the future. You know, here's hoping that that happens. Hopefully soon. We'll see I if, hope so. See if that happens. But uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Tapara, for coming by. Dr. Vladimir Tapara from the Institute of International Politics and Economics in Belgrade. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for your invitation once again. Great. And I'm Micah Terrell with 91.9 Public Affairs and APSU TV.